Up in a New York Minute on Art Rocks, a Shreveport painter whose art invites no demands that you suspend disbelief. Ballet dancers breaking down walls, saving New Mexico's WPA art treasures, and a teen whose passion for music simply cannot be contained. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. Shreveport-based visual artist Joshua Chambers wants to offer you, the viewer, an invitation to suspend your disbelief. In a past life, Chambers worked in theatre set design, which taught him to take limited space and make it feel infinite. That's what he likes to do in his work, strip things down to the bare minimum and then invite viewers to do what the theatre demands, agree to the imagination of it all. Here's Josh to explain. My style is illustrative and narrative and more of a minimalist approach. It uses a lot of allegory and metaphor. Humorous, a little absurdist, relationship-based. Oftentimes when I'm drawing out, it's really tempting to put as much imagery and information into the surface as possible. But I've found over the years doing that, that it often limits the viewer from really exploring it and establishing their portion of the narrative. Because ultimately the goal is for them to have enough to begin and to get the underlining text to it, but then to take it and to apply it to their own personal view. What I've heard people say as they're deciphering it is because they don't have a plethora of information, they often have to say, well, based on what I know, I think this means this. Or based on my experience, this made me feel like this one time, or this reminds me of a time when I felt like that. And then they start to create those stories around it. It is very difficult to pare it down to those single images. And often by the time the composition hits, a painting or a surface of a painting, it's been filtering through and cycling through my sketchbooks for a year or so, trying to get down to that quintessential grouping and selection of imagery to get that, that right story. Finding the imagery and deciding on the imagery, it's an extensive amount of research. I like to read a lot. I like to find out how culturally people view different imagery. In the piece Hold Me, there's the ape and the crane together. Both are images that I use regularly. Yeah. They come from different allegories, but I like to pair them together. The ape is clearly very angry and upset and holding strings that are tied to the ankles of the crane. And the crane is struggling with being pulled on by the ape. The text for the piece is Hold Me, which often elicits a humorous response from the viewer because you have what appears to be a very negative, difficult situation, but then you have this declaration of need from one character to the other. I really enjoy children's fables and stories and fairy tales and allegory and that sort of thing, so I like that you can use the animal as a stand-in for a person. When I was growing up, some of my favorite movies were Every Which Way But Loose and like those that included apes as like the, the silly, uncontrollable character. That character tends to represent like the more mischievous, silly aspect of my personality. Oftentimes I'll add phrases to the paintings. Uh, they come from conversations I have with people or snippets of literature that I've read. They morph and change as I remember them or re-remember them. So it 
creates another level to the story, another layer. When reevaluating that moment where that dialogue seemed to have the most impact, then that's when I'll start to recreate that scene with these allegorical characters. And so it takes something that could be a very personal moment, but turns it into something that has a uh, broader interpretation and appeal or application to a wider audience than just myself. Consolation Prize for Decline is a work in progress. I was reading a lot of Hans Christian Andersen and there's a story about the wild swans. And uh, in that story, brothers are saved from being turned into swans but one brother in particular runs out of time in the process of undoing the magic spell and everything but his body returns back to normal except for one wing which i've always found that fascinating because in a lot of old stories and old fairy tales you have everything returned to normal but often there's always one thing left that's not quite right afterwards i was drawn to that story because i think that's a very human right like we we grow and we change and we improve and we go through things and things are repaired and we come out better but often we have those scars yeah. the piece a friend is a friend is part of a series of pieces of work that I've done on paper using that same cutting and embossing type approach to get the text in there I like the imagery of the two crows together and how they're tied and joined and you're not sure if it's a good situation or a negative situation but I like that idea of playing around with the relationships we have with other people and sometimes what and who we connect ourselves with and how sometimes that can be really appreciated and fun and sometimes it has its negative aspects. The color field is really my opportunity to play because so much of the composition is planned ahead of time and a lot of it's mapped up and deliberately placed in the composition and I've all planned out in my sketchbook and so when it comes to the color fields that's the opportunity I get just to kind of have fun with the paint and sometimes it results in gradients and color changes and sometimes it's a little bit more subtle and solid throughout the piece but usually almost always it's an attempt to evoke some sort of mood be it one of unease or comfort or just curiosity the paintings are all on a hardwood that's couched on either a birch or a pine support. So it's all painted on wood. I started off painting on canvas a long time ago, but given the inclusion of the text and how many layers of paint that takes and the reworking of the surface and all that sort of stuff, wood just holds up better to that amount of effort and reworking. And I find that I enjoy the wood because it's a lot more sturdy you can get that smoother surface quality at the end. I teach for the Caddo Parish Talented Art Program. I was really fortunate through all levels of my education to always have teachers and mentors who didn't want to see work that looked like theirs. They wanted to see work that looked like mine and work that came from me and my voice. And so I try to recreate those experiences with my students so they too can find their individual voice. I still want them to make the best work they can make as far as skill and technique and things like that. But ultimately I want their artwork to look like their artwork, just like my artwork looks like my artwork. We do our best, but even the finest television can't always do justice to art. So you can get out and see some for yourself. Here are some of our top picks for notable exhibits coming soon to a museum or a gallery near you.
more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, the new free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. What's more, the Art Rocks website features every episode of this program, so to see or share any episode again, log on to lpb.org and navigate to Art Rocks. How about a change of scene? The Rochester City Ballet is one of a handful of ballet companies in the United States that is truly breaking down the walls of formality. During their productions, the RCB turns down the music and the lights up, all in the name of inclusion. Take a look at this hypersensory, very friendly production of The Ugly Duckling. Everyone at Rochester City Ballet loves ballet and the performing arts. We want to share it with everyone and that's why we decided to do the sensory friendly show. Children on the autism spectrum respond to stimuli differently and it may be very difficult for them to sit in the dark. So one of the first things we do with a sensory friendly show is keep the lights on halfway. We also will take out very loud sounds that might disrupt someone. When a child with autism hears a loud sound or sees a strobe light or flashing lights, they can feel very, very uncomfortable. And we want to make everyone have a great time at our show. The Ugly Duckling is about, I guess, finding your place in society and how, how we develop and how we fit into certain situations. As for the sensory friendly audience, I think it's, it's very relevant for them as well. Just because, you know, the Ugly Duckling, it, it's, you know, she's born in a nest of ducks and it's not her fault. She's born into a place where she has normal, she thinks she has normal siblings, but they look different than her, you know. Uh, she sounds different than they do and therefore she's kind of put on the outskirts of things. Um, but they don't know why they're doing it to her. That's the a, that's a, that's a thing about it. You know, they, they have no reason other than the way she looks and the way she sounds. And that's the message is they're not given time for growth or time for development to see who she really is and, and understanding. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a huge message in there for everybody, for kids, children and adults. The Ugly Duckling. I mean, it's, it's a perfect show. You know, she spent the whole time wanting to be included. And that's no different for, for any other human being um, out there, whether you have challenges or whether you have differences or not. It's a show that was what they call sensory friendly. So for kids that struggle with loud noises and lighting and needing you know, some fidget time or fidget room, it's a really nice place to be able to come and just watch a show, a good show, and not have to worry about some of the other extra things that you normally would, you know, when, you, when you're going to a show. Share that with everybody. The Great Depression notwithstanding, the 1930s proved a fruitful time for the creation of public art because of the Works Progress Administration's, or WPA's, Federal Arts Project. New Mexico was one of the states that benefited most, and today a preservation society is working hard to restore some of the original artworks to prominence. In the process, they're revealing a lot about that state's legacy. been unearthing not just historic pieces of New Mexican art, you've been unearthing New Mexico history. 
Well, how did these pieces go lost? Well, if some painting was hanging in somebody's office for 20 years and that person was, uh, goes out of office and he's closing out his office and he's taking everything home, some of those pieces have gone home with them too. Now you can't very well take murals home, mm -hmm. but in some cases the buildings have been torn down mm -hmm. and the, build the artwork has been lost. It's either been destroyed mm -hmm. or in one case we know of it was an oil on canvas and it was in a federal building in Roswell. The building was torn down. Everybody thought it was lost or just destroyed. Ironically, some years later, uh, a judge found it in the basement of the federal courthouse at 421 Gold mm -hmm. and said, I want that in my courtroom. Did he know what he was looking at or did he just like I, I think he just loved, just loved the subject. It's mm -hmm. called Justice Tempered with Mercy, Uphold the Right. It was done by Emil Bistrom from Taos. I can imagine a judge being down in the basement, but you also go and, and unearth these works of art. So what's that like? There's no central list, but I found some lists. So then I just started calling people or traveling to a site. I found that if you go to a place and ask for the employee that's been there the longest <laughs> and see if they remember it, sure. and there was one I've I wasn't able to find, but at least I found out what happened to it. Uh, I found a woman in the cafeteria who'd worked there for years and I asked her, you know what happened to this painting? I don't have a picture of it. Oh yeah, I saw that in the dumpster. And I said, in the dumpster? Yeah, the frame broke, so they threw it out. He There's a, a lot of etchings that were done by Jean Kloss, all very unique to New Mexico. And those were distributed out to all the schools and some universities. There's uh, one still at the National Park Service building in Santa Fe. What you look for is there's a brass plaque down at the bottom that names the Public Works of Art Project and the year. I found one of those uh, somewhere in the north. The frame was there, but the etching is gone. And another guy did some, and his name was B.J. O. Nordfeld. He did lithographs, and um, those are the kinds that really kind of, you know, get lost. There's one in the state capitol building now that was sold in a garage sale, and somebody found it and gave it to me to put into the capitol building. And these are federal properties. They belong to us. Well, and this is why it's like treasure hunting, because you don't know what, people don't necessarily know what they're looking at. El río Manuel no volvió, sus amigos no lo han encontrado. Ay, pobre Manuel Antonio. One day, somebody came in and said, look, I just found this in a box in a closet. And I opened up the box. There was an oil painting by uh, Isla McAfee of buffaloes. And it had been taken out of the frame, out of the stretcher, and folded twice so that it was in four pieces hanging together just by strings. That was one of the very first things that our organization, the National New Deal Preservation and the New Mexico chapter, spent money to have that rewoven so that it was a solid piece again and restored and it is in the Albuquerque uh, city chambers. Can, can you tell us a story about the moment where you first uh, discovered the artwork at New Mexico Highlands? There are eight of them. They are over every door, interior and exterior door of the lobby at Illfield Auditorium. And each one had a mural with a scroll in the center and the center had a quotation. Mm -hmm. Then the mural depicted that quotation, which also depicted the department of the university. So we were trying to find them. I had a picture that showed they existed. I took a conservator over there and we stood under the door jams of each one of those doors and he said, there's canvas up there. There's paint on top of the mm -hmm. canvas. The end result, we found that there were mm -hmm. five and six coats of white paint covering all these murals. So when we then took another conservator over there 
to restore them when we got a lot of money to pay for it. They just carefully, wow. with chemicals, took all the paint off and the murals were there and they are still there. Why is it important to preserve these things? Because this is our legacy from the 30s and 40s, a time that was really difficult here in the state. We were part of that Dust Bowl era. People were struggling, the drought, it was awful. And there was no jobs. It's a time much worse than what we're in right now. So what made you say, I, I have to do this? I felt it was something that everybody needed to know about and look at and appreciate. It's just an amazing thing to, to see these things when you walk into a building and, and see them, the story they're telling. It's the history of a town or a county or the people or what they did. Como el hilo no se corte, yo a mi tierra volveré, yo a mi tierra volveré. We need more people to know because it's their story in many cases. It was their family members that participated in it. De mi querida patria me van a retirar. Hopscotching east to Orlando, Florida, where high schooler Jean-Marie Glazer has set a record for the number of years spent in the Florida Symphony Youth Orchestra. But music is not this young man's only area of interest. Watch this. I'm Jean-Marie Glazer. I'm a senior at Boone High School, and I'm a cellist, a barbershopper, and an opera singer. My family moved down from Montreal in Quebec about 17 years ago. I've been playing with the Florida Youth Symphony Orchestra for 12 years. This is my 12th year. I actually hold the record for longest running member. What I love most about playing the cello is the chance to play in a 70 or 80 piece symphonic orchestra. We have all of these minds coming together with a single purpose. They say, all right, we're gonna pick this masterpiece by some super genius in, from the past and we're gonna perfect this thing and we're gonna perform it. And you're working together to make this gorgeous, gorgeous work of art, you know, the kind of, it's almost the voice of God coming down and penetrating the hearts of everyone you're playing for. It's, it's for everyone else who comes in and who enriches their lives with this experience that you get to give them, that you get to give them. I think it's a privilege. John marie is very special because he has played cello since a very young age, but he's also unique in that he has a very strong voice. Könnt ihr brausen die Räder führen, könnt ihr wehen durch alle Heine, I've gotten into opera now. I was able to sing the Nutcracker, an abridged version of the Nutcracker, in middle school. And that kind of gave me the bug for it. And eventually I stumbled on the Florida Youth Opera Theater. And so with them, I've been able to pick up on pieces from the Magic Flute, from Don Giovanni, from all these different opera pieces. And I've realized that it's something I really enjoy doing, and that I can see myself doing that all the time. So opera is what I'm sticking to. Let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love with you. Let me hear you whisper that you love me too. 
I got into barbershop through my mother, actually. She was singing with the Sweet Adelines for a couple of years and figured I'd enjoyed it. So at the beginning of this year, I was able to recruit a couple of gentlemen and make a barbershop quartet. We call ourselves the Boone Barbershop Quartet because we love barbecue. I'm in love with you, with you. My favorite choice out of different career paths is definitely going to be traveling the world to sing because I think it's it's something a lot more intimate to sing to someone as opposed to play to someone and I like to I want to remove any kind of disconnect that there might be between me and my audience I love you only And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But never mind, you can find, share, and send episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want more insight into the art and culture of Louisiana, Country Roads Magazine is a great resource for learning what's going on in the arts all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks to you for watching. <laughs>